Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. You're listening to The Drag. Sara Drete majors in physical education at Texas Southmost College in Brownsville, Texas. It's a two-year college, and Sara's a model student. She's got a job working in the physical education or PE department to earn some extra money. She helps out with some of the PE classes. Part of her job is checking out video materials from the college's media services department. Instructors show videos in class like first aid or childbirth videos. It's the late 1980s, so she physically has to go check out the materials. And the guy usually working the checkout desk? Norberto Martinez. My name is Norberto Martinez, and my connection with Sarah started, I would say, like in 86, 87, or 88. Norberto's a student, too. He has a work-study job. You know, one of those positions that many colleges provide for low-income students to have an on-campus job to make some extra cash. We used to handle the audiovisual department. We used to handle the films, audio cassettes, uh, VHS tapes. Sara visits Norberto's desk a lot. Again, I got to know Sara. Well, because she used to come like every other day because she was very regular. She would come to the media services and uh, she would fill out the card and she knew what to take. So what she required, that instructor had requested. There was, there was always some request and she would always come mostly every day to sign the card, take the film, or sometimes just to sign the card. Norberto notices Sara's unique appearance. She's tall and blonde, and like I've said before, that's a combination you don't often see in the Rio Grande Valley. She was very athletic. Uh, they had, had color eyes, which was different from her. But she was very talkative. She would talk to everybody, very friendly. And I said she was from Matamoros, Mexico. Sara lives in Matamoros, but she crosses the border to Brownsville to attend classes. The walk from the border bridge to the college campus is just a few blocks, so it's an easy and common commute. We kind of build a, we had a group, we kind of build a bond. It's being from Mexico and, you know, the, the language barrier. So it was it was a small group, but we, we kind of knew each other. And uh, and that's how come I, I knew Sara Drete. Norberto sees Sara as a pretty normal college student, just like him. They spent weeks bonding over the language barrier and life as work-study students. And she's popular, smart, she plays volleyball. But one day, when she comes in to reserve equipment, something strange happens. And she had a necklace. And it was a necklace made out of string, a string necklace. It wasn't something fancy. But I noticed that her necklace was, was kind of brownish, brownish red. And I mean, it stood out right away. And I, I was about to touch it, say, oh, look, what is that? And she slapped, she slapped my hand. I mean, it hit me hard. I said, hey, did I say something wrong? Why? Well, don't touch it. Don't touch it. I mean, she changed from being friendly to uh, protective. Say, don't touch it. Norberto's startled, to say the least. He's used to this super friendly woman, and he's never seen Sara this combative before. And then... She reveals more about the necklace. She says Norberto can't touch it because it's been cleaned by her master. And I said, what? Yeah, yeah. He has, he, he, you see these cake things here? It's blood. I said, wow, blood. Yeah, they say, yeah, but it's blood from roosters, from animals. And, and nobody's supposed to touch it if, because what, this is to protect me. If somebody does it, tries to harm me, now if you were to touch it, Everything that comes to me, it will it will go forward to you, because you're my friends, and you know I know you. I don't want you for you to 
have been anything to you. So that's why I slap you. After that interaction, Norberto notices Sara is always wearing that string necklace covered in animal blood. Sometimes she hides it under her shirt, but it's always there. And as time passes, he starts to notice even more behavior that he finds strange. And we notice that she begins to have a car, drive a car. And we okay, well, maybe uh, she found a better job or she found a sugar daddy because she was young and beautiful. So we always thought that she was dating a, a guy from Matamoros or some rich guy from the costumes because costumes used to be, uh, would make money like crazy. And we had the idea that she was dating somebody and she would, and he would have bought her a car. And later she had a phone. It was those uh, phones are in a bag. It was cell phone. Now, cell phones were super expensive. The only people that I knew that had cell phones were doctors or lawyers. And they would carry them like a purse. So and she had one of those. And he said, wow, man, they must be paying you really good. Sara's definitely not buying a car or a cell phone with the money she earns from her part-time job on campus. Norberto thinks Sara's a little odd, but they keep hanging out as friends. He figures whatever she gets up to in her spare time is her business. His view of her changes when Norberto watches a movie over spring break. It's called The Believers. It's a new movie. It came out in 1987, and Martin Sheen plays a psychologist who works for the New York Police Department. He's working a case featuring a series of ritualistic child murders, and he finds out there's a cult behind it. A cult practicing a specific type of brujaria, or witchcraft. Even though it's spring break, Norberto still has to work. But things are slow, so Norberto and a friend decide to watch the movie while passing time in the AV department. When we had our movie and we were looking at it, and uh, we were looking at one time where they were, uh, the guy was doing, uh, was preaching something, right? But it was like, a, a, it wasn't Spanish, it was something different. And uh, we did not hear her come in. And by the time we knew she was repeating the same thing as what the guy in the movie was saying, like an echo, you know, what, uh, and, uh, and even with a tone. So we, we kind of looked back and it was Sara. And, and, and we said, hey, have you seen the movie? He said, no. This, that, and she said, real proud. That's, that, that, that is my religion. You know, what, Paloma Yombe? Or, or brujería dijo, no, es Paloma Yombe. This is, this is my, my, my religion. She was like very proud saying that. This is when Norberto knew something definitely isn't normal about Sara Adrete. She doesn't say much about it, but based on how she's reacting to the movie, it seems like she's saying she practices this religion called Paloma Mayombe. Norberto doesn't know anything about it, but the cult members in the movie are murdering children, so it doesn't seem good. It's off-putting for Norberto, but he still has to see her when she comes into his office. She shows up again over that same spring break. He said, hey guys, you know what? This weekend I'm gonna have a party in Matamoros. He said, oh cool. He said, he said, ah, but it's spring break. I know, that's why I'm inviting you. I wanna, I want, I'm inviting, personally inviting you, Norberto and Rene, my friend, so you can come to Matamoros and we're gonna have a blast. I got some friends, man. You, you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy it. Norberto's not really into the idea of going to a party in Matamoros. He knows how the city gets during spring break. Thousands of rowdy college students from the United States flood the bars and streets of the city to drink and party. Norberto doesn't drink, plus the crowds don't sound appealing. No, you know what? I, I appreciate it, but I don't, I'm, I'm not going. And my friend would say, hey, let's go, man. It's going to be free booze and maybe girls and, and, and have fun. And you know what? No, I'm not, I don't care for drinking. So I kind of refuse. I said, no, thank you very much. Maybe when this happens, when spring break is over, we might go and, you know, have a beer or something. And she told me, no, man, no sabe lo que te pierdes. You have no idea what you're missing. And I go, well, it's okay. You know, I'll, I'll pass. Norberto didn't realize until months later that by declining Sara Adrete's invitation to party in Matamoros, he made a life-altering decision, a potentially 
life-saving decision. It was spring break, 1989, the same week Mark Hero disappeared. Just a month before the Texas college student was found in one of more than a dozen graves at Rancho Santa Elena just outside Matamoros, and months before Sara would be arrested for her involvement in the cult that killed, mutilated, and ritually sacrificed Mark Kilroy. I'm Jackie Barra, and this is episode four. Let's fast forward in time a bit, all the way to 2004, 15 years after the murders on Rancho Santa Elena. John Carlin's a freelance reporter for El País, the second biggest newspaper in Spain, but John's based in Mexico City. As a freelancer, his stories can take him pretty much anywhere. So on this particular day, he's in a Mexican prison to interview a convicted killer. She was so... I mean, she's a prisoner... But she clearly had become, you know, the mistress, the sort of commander of that jail. You know, she 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 clearly had enormous sway over the other prisoners um, and indeed over the authorities. I mean, there she was in this office sitting behind a desk as if she were the governor of the prison. You know, amazing. That's John talking about Zara Adrete. Sara served in a prison sentence for her involvement in the death of Mark Kilroy and more than a dozen others. In the years since the murders, Sara's face has been plastered across tabloids around the world. The tabloids claim she's the godmother, la madrina, of the cult that killed Mark. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, there's a particular strain of sensationalist press in Mexico, which I don't know about now, but in my day was the stuff that sold the most copies. I mean, you know, kind of daily newspapers with colored pictures splattered on the on the front page of blood spattered bodies freshly killed. I mean, it's, there's something really incredibly gruesome there. And, and, and so the, the, you know, conveying the perception of Sara Aldrete as la narco satanica, Sara's 39 years old when John interviews her in prison. She's among four others who were arrested for the series of ritual human sacrifices. But despite the fact that she's just one of dozens of people involved in these deaths, the media fixated on her. And so she was just perfect, you know, and she was tall and blonde and, you know, I mean, it's just, she just absolutely as if she was, she'd been manufactured, um, as a, as a gift from God for the sensationalist Mexican press, you know, um, just such an easy target, and not, you know, and and it's, we're not talking about a press here that's very disposed to consider nuance. Let's just sell this sensational character, and we'll sell more newspapers through her. In his story for El País, John writes that Sara looks way different than the other prisoners. Her hair is dyed blonde. She's wearing sunglasses on her head bright pink lipstick, and a gold bracelet. John writes, Tiene a sus carceleros en la palma de la mano, which means she has her jailers in the palm of her hand. I talked to John in the fall of 2022, 18 years after he interviewed Sara. He still can't forget meeting her. Like when I reached out to you, kind of what was that like first? Or what did you, like the first thing that popped into your head when like her name was in your inbox again. When, when you mentioned her name to me, right, it's like a sort of a ghost from the past, because yes, I mean, like I say, I've done so many stories around the world since then that I had to sort of dig into my, you know, mental archive. Well, immediately this, the image of this, of this large, this sort of Amazonian blonde woman um, came to my eyes. And I remember, and, and immediately, before I reread my article, um, I remember the sensations that came back to me were on the one hand, there was something a bit intimidating about her. There was also something sort of sardonic, humor, ironic about her. And at the same time, terribly vulnerable. And so the kind of summing all that up, the sense I had was that her irony, her sort of 
slightly intimidating, tough, commanding air were actually a mask for what was, I think, a deeply sad and troubled person. On the day John interviewed Sarah, she started her conversation with, of all things, a joke. You know, um, am I going to wear beige today? Am I going to wear beige, 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 beige or beige? Because beige was the color of the uniform she had to wear as a prisoner. And so she was obviously being funny, being ironic. But John says she gets serious during the interview. Sada told John that she's innocent of the crime she's been convicted of. That her only crime was meeting one man. Adolfo Constanzo. The Godfather. In the late 80s, Sara Drete meets Adolfo Constanzo for the first time. He's in his mid-twenties, a young, handsome, charming Cuban-American man who's just moved from Miami to Mexico City. He was a, a Johnny-come-lately. That's Dr. Tony Zavaleta again. He's the former professor who taught Sara Drete, and he's an expert in various folk religions. He moved from Miami to Mexico City. And because he felt that in Mexico City, there were opportunities for him, and there were. So he, he began to hook, he, he presented himself, and apparently he was very successful, to a lot of uh, uh, people who were in the arts, uh, movie stars and singers and people like that, who would go to him asking him to do certain things for them. Constanzo wants to make a name for himself in Mexico. For years, he's practiced as a santero. That's a sort of priest for the religion Santeria. Santeria is popular in Mexico, and it's a religion that's a sort of fusion between Catholicism and a traditional African religion. Santeria is complex, and I'll explain more about it later, but essentially people who practice Santeria worship various saints instead of one god. Constanzo's got a reputation for being a really good santero, and he's kind of a big deal, like Zavaleta just said. He was such a big deal that he was sought out by Mexican celebrities to perform limpias for them, which are a type of spiritual cleansing. Uh, Constanzo did a lot of cleansing and stuff to people in Mexico City. He was, he was pretty famously known. Limpias are a common practice in Santeria and Mexican culture. In order to cleanse someone's spirit, a santero would grab some kind of blessed object, like plants or herbs like rue or rosemary, and then use that object to help extract all the negative energy a person might have. Other times, that sacred object is an egg. I've had it done several times with an egg in my family. Constanzo became so good at performing limpias that he made connections with some very powerful people. On the day he meets Sara Derete for the first time, he's actually hanging out with the Comandante of the Mexican Federal Police. No, not the current Comandante Juan Benitez Ayala, the Comandante before him. So according to the former Cameron County investigator, George Cavito, Constanzo comes to Matamoros because he's been asked by the Comandante to provide protection against the cartels. It's a little up in the air about exactly why the Comandante wanted protection from the cartels, but then Constanzo spots Sara Trete, a tall, blonde, and young woman. Here's Gavito again. He noticed this girl crossing the street. He introduced himself. That was Sara. So he starts talking to Sara, he starts going out with Sara, so Sara starts falling in love with this guy. I mean, this guy's a good-looking guy, you know? And, uh, and then Sara starts talking to him, and he says, well, the comandante is. He said, well, I got some friends of mine that might be able to, you know, I know that they're running narcotics and stuff, and, you know, might, might need the protection of the comandante that you're your friend and everything. So that's when he introduced them to the to the Hernandez group and all that, and running dope. This is where the facts get a little shaky. Reporting on a story based in Mexico 33 years ago has been difficult, to say the least. Everyone remembers what happened a little differently. And like I've mentioned before, the media sensationalized the heck out of the story. 
You just heard Gavito say that Sara fell in love with Constanzo, but Sara told the journalist John Carlin that that wasn't the case. It's hard to know what the truth is here since the only person who can really say whether or not she loved Constanzo is Sara herself, and she denies it. But regardless of Sara's feelings for Constanzo, romantic or otherwise, it's clear the two at least had a close friendship in the 80s. Remember, Sara is classmates with Serafine Hernandez, and they're pretty good friends too. Serafine's a part of the family that runs that big marijuana operation at our Rancho Santa Elena. So when Constanzo befriends Sara and finds out who she's friends with, Constanzo sees dollar signs, and he wants in. Here's Tony Zabaleta again. Okay, and he, he did that, and, and apparently he was, he was successful. But that wasn't enough. He hooked up with people who were trafficking drugs, because he was not a drug trafficker. He hooked up with people who were trafficking drugs and transporting drugs all the way to the border and then across the border into the United States. Uh, and, and he put himself up or posed himself as someone who could help them not to get caught, not to be caught. And so they tried him out, and apparently they, they felt that it worked. Constanzo uses Sara to get in with the Hernandez family. With his good looks and natural charisma, it's easy to see how he starts to gain power within their organization. He bonds with Sara over their shared interest in Santeria, which he's extremely skilled at, and he's really good at avoiding law enforcement. It helps that he's befriended powerful people in Mexico. But he's also managed to convince the Hernandez family and other members of the cult that were soon become known as Los Narcos Antonicos that he's invisible to law enforcement. He also tells them that if they listen to him, they too can become invisible and for a drug smuggling gang, being invisible is exactly what they needed. Uh, they believed that he in fact was successful and that he could do it. And so then Little by little, over a period of time, not that much time, he, he, became, he became the leader and they, because they believed in him and, trust, and trusted in, in him. And it works. Remember, Serafin Hernandez thought law enforcement couldn't see him. That is the whole reason he got pulled over at the checkpoint in front of Rancho Santa Elena in the first place. Constanzos basically brainwashed a whole crew of drug dealers. Constanzo's power grows. He introduces the drug gang to something called Palo Mayombe. It's sort of like Santeria, that popular religion practiced in Mexico. Actually, it's often confused with Santeria. Santeria and Palo Mayombe are both African-Cuban religions, but they come from different African nations. Santeria originates with the Yoruba people in Western Africa, whereas Palo Mayombe comes from the Congo region. Both religions were brought to Cuba through the transatlantic slave trade where they kind of fused with Catholicism in order to survive. After the Cuban Revolution in 1959, immigration from Cuba to the U.S. increased. So both religions eventually made their way to the U.S. That's how Adolfo Constanzo became familiar with the religions. As a Cuban-American living in Miami, his mother practiced Santeria, and Constanzo himself practices both religions. And in both religions, there are multiple deities called Orishas, rather than one god. So the two religions have similar origins and share other similarities. But there are big differences. Here's Dr. Tony Zavaleta again. He's an expert on Santeria and Palo Mayombe, so he understands the difference as well. Palo Mayombe and they're very, the uninitiated and uninformed usually put them together. But they don't go together. They're different. That doesn't mean that they can't be practiced by one person because Constanzo uh, did, and he learned that from his mother. Uh, but Palo Mayomba is the worship not of saints, but uh, they, they believe in the sanctity and or power of different plants and branches. That's why it's called Palo, Palo coming from a branch, a stick. In addition to being a santero or a priest in Santeria, Constanzo is also what's known as a palero, 
essentially a priest in the Balamayambe religion. In the Baleros' main source of power and worship is what's called a prenda, or an inganga. We'll use the term inganga in this podcast because that's what most people we interviewed called it. The inganga is nothing more than a cast iron cauldron. The balero, or priest, fills the inganga with sticks made of various types of wood. Usually, practitioners of Palomayombe should collect the sticks themselves, but Zavalita says they can be purchased at places like the Mercado Sonora, or the witch market in Mexico City. And, and so then the palero begins to nurture the cauldron, and they believe, bring, bring the cauldron to life. You, they would bring it to life by uh, placing th- different things in the cauldron, uh, saying the, the magical tran- uh, words of, of magic. The Nganga essentially acts as a shrine to worship the various deities of Palomayombe. And what goes into the Nganga depends on what deities the Belero wants to worship. The type of wood will vary, but certain deities require certain animal elements, like the bones or tooth of a horse, or feathers from birds like parrots or vultures. When we were researching this episode, my executive producer, Kitty Auka, read a book about Bola Mayombe, written by a Norwegian anthropologist, Nikolaj de Matos Friswald. He's an expert in various spiritual practices, including Bola Mayombe. In the book, Friswald outlines the different deities and what they require in their ngangas. But this isn't an exhaustive list. According to experts, Balomayombe is a religion that's got a few rough guides, and a lot of the rest of it is made up according to practitioners' personal needs or traditions. Which could explain a lot about why Constanzo was so successful at manipulating the Hernandez drug gang into following him. So you can take this with a grain of salt, because it's just Friswald's interpretation of Balomayombe. But only two deities listed in Friswald's book require human sacrifice one who essentially represents feminine power, love, and sexuality, who acquires the skull of a sex worker, and the lord of death, Katie and Pempe, who requires an entire human corpse. And based on what we know about what was found in the Nganga, it seems like the lord of death is who Constanzo built his Nganga for. It was believed that it was now a living thing that the palero could control. So you could ask the spirit, so it had a spirit, and in some cases multiple spirits, and the, you could ask the spirits to do something for you. Uh, win the lottery, cure an illness, kill somebody, destroy a marriage, I mean anything. There's no, there are no exceptions. They could, all, they, they invo- they're involved in all those kinds of things. So that's, that's the Palo Mayombe. The more items you put in the Nganga, the more its power grows. And when the Nganga's power grows, so does Constanzo's. So sometime during the summer of 1988, nine months before Mark Caroy's body is found, Constanzo starts instructing the members of the Hernandez drug gang to do more than just traffic drugs. He asks them to kidnap people and bring them to Rancho Santa Elena to be sacrificed to the Nganga. One of the reasons he was abducting and killing people and putting their remains in the cauldron was to increase its power, you know, increase its, its power. Uh, and that's what he that's what he was doing there there back in the day you know 89 80 yeah 89 um, 89 was a was a very unusual time in in Brownsville and by early 1989 Constanzo was looking for a very specific type of person to feed his nganga we're told he got it in his head that he wanted a gringo un gringo educado Inteligente. So he want, he told his people, go out and find me a gringo, an intelligent college student, and and so that's and because he felt he felt that the 
the spiritual essence and especially the brain of that kind of a person would be very effective. And I'm not sure why. I don't know if he was of his Nganga was losing power or whatever. We don't know that. I don't know that. But that's what he was doing. Human sacrifice isn't used frequently in Palo Mayombe, according to our research and to the experts we've talked to for this podcast. It's mostly animals and plants. Zavaleta says Constanzo took the religion above and beyond what everyday practitioners do. Like I mentioned, the person practicing the religion can adapt its practices to their needs. I think he took it well beyond what was acceptable even for people in that, in that religion. Um, but Constanzo would go into a trance. He became a different person. So during, during the, the process of sacrifice, it wasn't Constanzo anymore. It was somebody, some spirit that would come on into his body and, and he would speak, we're told, a language that nobody could identify, which obviously would be an African language. So he would become a spirit, the spirit of one of these Orishas would come to him and direct him in terms of what he was supposed to do. And that was quite common and happened many times. As Constanzo instructs members of the cult to kidnap people for their rituals, Sara Adrete focuses on attracting more members to the cult. She's going around asking people to watch the movie The Believers, the same movie she walked in on Norberto Martinez watching over spring break. And I found that very interesting because that's in fact a way uh, a new religion or a cult would move into an area by uh, educating, educating people. And she, was doing, and she was doing that. But all of this comes to a stop once Mark disappears. Everyone is looking for Mark and the press is crawling around Matamorros. So Sara and the rest of the cult have to wait for the heat to die down so they can get back to business. Sara even helps out with the search even though his body is on the ranch the whole time. Here's Norberto again, talking about Sara passing out posters looking for Mark. And you know what? The interesting thing is that she was very active with the Roy stuff. She would be posting, uh, making posters, I mean, making copies, post. And she would ask for permission, hey, can I put a poster here? And what is it about, about this guy that is a, a medical student from UT that disappeared in Mexico in Matamoros? So I'm, I'm trying to see if I can help locate and she would have posters, you know, eight by ten black and white information and she would post them in different locations at the college. Like I've told you in previous episodes, the Brownsville community really came together to find Mark. Even one of the people who was involved in his disappearance. She I think I'm pretty sure she knew what had happened. Or maybe she didn't know the guy, but uh he, he was actually physically trying to help trying to locate Uh, There's conflicting information about how deeply Sara got involved with the Hernandez drug gang and with Constanzo's cult. In the months following Mark's death, the media definitely played up Sara's connections, calling her a siren and a priestess. But even to this day, Sara denies any involvement with the murders. Here's Tony Zavaleta again. That's an important part of this. All law enforcement, being law enforcement, were concerned, were, were, were convinced that she was the high priestess of the cult and had been directly involved in the murders, human sacrifice. And I knew that wasn't true. And, and she told me it wasn't true. But even before she told me it wasn't true, I knew it wasn't true because in this cult of Palo Mayombe and Santeria, women are not involved, are allowed, and women are not, do not participate. Since he's an expert in Palo Mayombe, he feels certain that Sara wasn't directly involved in the killings. Instead, he thinks the media had a right calling her a siren. She lured men to their deaths. 
But Zavaleta says she wasn't the one who killed them herself. They simply are not in involved. And in fact, Constanzo's people said that she wasn't involved, she wasn't there. Uh, her job, the job that they had for Sada was as a temptress to lure people, in this case Mark Kilroy, into a car or a van or something to be taken to the ranch. But, but uh, there's absolutely no way in my mind and from, from what I know from the, what they do or don't do, that she would have been allowed in, in, the, in the, the room, uh, the shack, a dirt floor shack, for the sacrifice of Mark Hillway. She Is she innocent? Did she know that these things were happening? Yes, of course. And so she's as guilty as sin in that sense, but she did not part actually participate in, in my opinion, in the, the murders and the human sacrifice of Mark Kilroy and others. Serafin Hernandez, the man who led police to the bodies, himself even said Sara wasn't involved. She, uh, she, didn't, she didn't tell us what to do, I mean, but she was one of the, uh, the, the, one of the main persons, I mean, but she, she was like, uh, she was never involved in killings. Norberto, Sara's friend from college, has conflicting feelings about Sara's arrest. I really think, I really think they, they were trying to find a, a, a scapegoat in a sense that they, they, they wanted to find somebody to find the culprit for the murders because it wasn't only, only him, Kilroy, they found other different bodies, but they wanted to find out who actually did the killing. And in fact, what bothered me a little bit, it was uh, she was never found guilty of that. She was basically... Uh, found guilty of association, but with the whole group that they got, no, no one claimed to be the one who did it. Or, or they, you know, but it makes it very, very common for, for people that are, they're, they're picked up, they get tortured, and I mean, they, they'll tell you anything you want to hear. But I, I, don't, I don't think she ever said it was me or it was, it was, it was him or it was somebody else. So they could not pinpoint as who was uh, responsible for the murder. Norberto wishes Sara had been charged with more crimes, but even he doesn't think she's a killer. I think she knew what, what was going on. I'm not saying she was a, with a death call, she was a, she didn't want to because she, she was very close to, to Alonso. So she knew what, 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 what was going on, but, uh, I don't think she actually was involved with it. I don't think she had the guts to kill somebody, actually. No, she was just a good girl that got involved with the wrong guys. And because her beliefs made it worse, and uh, she fit in, in, within the group. And uh, Costanzo knew, knew that she was she was gifted, and she, she, she took advantage of all that. But when we talked to George Gavito, the Cameron County investigator, he had some choice words about Sara. She was a, a witch at night and a student during the day. Last episode, I told you about the raid at Rancho Santa Elena, where Serafina Hernandez led investigators to more than a dozen graves. In the days since investigators uncovered the bodies, they've been questioning every member of the Hernandez gang they rounded up. But there are two very important people they hadn't managed to arrest yet. Because we had Constanzo missing. We had Sara missing. So they check all the usual spots first. They, they went to Sara's house. She wasn't there. Uh, you know, they ran a search warrant, a search warrant. They kicked the door open, a search warrant in Mexico. They went in, they went in the house and she had an altar there. Uh, Santeria altar where she was practicing the whole thing and everything and the mother says we don't know where she's at the whole thing so Sara's parents are in absolute disbelief here's Leti Fernandez the TV reporter we talked to in an earlier episode I remember interviewing her parents and they lived across the river it was right by the border 
just elderly people in and just you just knew they were very sweet people anyway but so we went to interview them and they were just i remember how devastated they were that their daughter had been involved in this and and then they just they just couldn't believe it still nobody can find sara or constanzo so Cavito decides he wants to use all the media attention the case has received to his advantage. I called America Most Wanted. And because they had been at the, at the news conference, and they, one of the guys had given me a card. So we, we got on America Most Wanted. And when we got on America Most Wanted, we really, they really are good, man, about getting, getting calls and stuff. Everybody, ah, they're in Mexico City and all this stuff and everything. So... After America's Most Wanted features the case again, a manhunt ensues. Investigators get calls from all over the country, all over the world, from people who think they've seen Constanzo on the run. Investigators will later find out that Sara and Constanzo were at a Holiday Inn in Brownsville while law enforcement raided the ranch. But for four weeks, they stay on Sara and Constanzo's tails. Remember, Constanzo is well-connected and wealthy thanks to the Hernandez drug money. So he's slippery. Over and over again, the police get close to catching him. Then he gets away. So Gavita decides, let's go back to the ranch and see what we can figure out there. And he calls up a friend to join him. The first guy that I brought here was a uh, doctor. I, he was from, from Miami, Dade County. He, he, was, uh, he was a pathologist from Dade County and a professor for the University of Miami. And uh, he was into Santeria, Palo Mayombre, all this stuff and everything. The Palo Mayombre expert, Rafael Martinez, starts taking items out of the Nganga and educating investigators on what he thinks happened here. The Comandante Juan Benitez Ayala is a little superstitious, so he brings over a brujo. That's essentially a witch or someone who practices Santeria to check out the ranch too. He does a few blessings to cleanse the area of bad spirits. And then he turns to Gavito and he says, And the brujo said, look, the only way we're gonna catch this guy is to burn, burn down this place. Now there's an idea, Gavito thinks. He figures if Constanzo and whoever he's on the run with see video on the news of their sacred place on fire, maybe it'll agitate him enough to reveal himself. Well, sure enough, he, we got the inganga, we drank that out, dragged that out. We uh, filled the whole thing with gasoline. He, uh, he got a picture of, of uh, Contanzo, and he made me sign it, and Juan Benito Sayala signed it, and we folded it up, and we put it in the inganga, and filmed all this, and the media was filming all this and everything, and then me and Juan Benito Sayala go and, and burn it. Nearly 600 miles away, in an apartment in Mexico City, Adolfo Constanzo watches as everything he's built, everything he's worked so hard for, burns to ash. Next, on Season 3 of Darkness. This guy is in Mexico City, and he's watching this on TV. They were all in, a, in, a, in an apartment in Mexico City hiding. And he says this, this on TV, and he goes berserk. He goes crazy. Exactly what the brujo said that this guy was going to do, he just went berserk. So he gets one of the machine guns, and he starts shooting out of the room. So the cops come, and they show up, and then they see all these cop cars. So he starts throwing money. This season of Darkness is reported, hosted, and produced by me, Jackie Barra. Katie Penchik-Alka and Robert Quickly are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. 
Sewa Olivares is the lead sound designer and editor for this season of Darkness, and the assistant editor is Heather Stewart. Special thanks to Marian Navarro for being the lead reporter on this story when this project first began. The associate producers are Emily Rubin, Megan Kirby, Jake Herman, Khadija Balde, Bethany Stork, and Miranda Vilches. The artwork was designed by Helen Holsey and Alexa Georgilos. Sofia Vargas Garam is the Drags Marketing and Communications Manager, and Grace Robertson is the Drags PR Manager. Christian McDonald is our Technical Director. Special thanks to Bob Buckaloo at KVU TV in Austin for all his time and effort finding archival footage for us to use in these episodes. And thanks to KVU for letting us use the audio. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all her support and guidance. We also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, David Reif, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, and Kathleen Mabley of the Moody College of Communication. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com/donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students like me an amazing educational experience. Thank you. Ah, mm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com.